All right, so Obama claims that there's no such thing as truth, or at least implicitly he does. He says that we can't know weather, we can't control weather, and we can't control uprisings in faraway places, but we can come to an agreement. So what is that agreement going to be based upon? Is Obama admitting that there is such a thing as necessity? That there is a, an objective standard that uh, diverging opinions can be reconciled upon? Well, for him and for Christie and for the Democrats that joined with Christie, that objective standard is the necessity that we have gone beyond our means. That right now is the moment of truth where we have to slash budget budgets, we have to overcome factional differences, we have to live within our means, we've overextended our resources, and now we've got to face the truth and face the music. Well, I think we can agree with Obama and Christie that there is a necessity and that there has to be a change. But we have to ask then, are the, are the uprisings that we're seeing in Greece or in New Jersey against these types of policies, are they just the denial of reality, the denial of the inevitable, futile attempts to go against necessity? Right? Maybe Obama and Christie are the enlightened representatives of the people that have been elected to come in and make the tough choices and lead us to the future. Well, I think that idea of necessity is wrong. And I think what's missing then from that situation is a crucial element of consent. Right? So that um, that there's something by which Obama and Christie or the government of Greece is, mission, is missing a crucial authority based on lacking a certain consent of the people. That what's wrong about these policies is that it violates something sacred in the individual. And that, I mean, surely there's some distortion of a government and a relationship between the elected people and the government when, like, in the situation in Greece, you have the government deploying police with tear gas to impose their decisions upon the population to gain submission to these policies. So that there's a natural law of progress Right, innate in each, in each human being and in society as a whole. That's the necessity. And the consent to, uh, to policy, to government policy, by the people is what authorizes the government to make those decisions. So what awaits us in the United States in these next 10 days when the full weight of the reality of the budget situations is about to fall on us? Are the people of the United States going to consent to the sacrifices that Christie and Obama and others are demanding that they place on them. Can they? Can they consent to these policies? Is suicide moral? Uh, Mr. President, Mr. Governor, you're asking me to commit suicide, but my preacher says suicide is not moral. So what recourse will the government of Obama move to in order to carry out these insane policies? So as we go into this July 4th weekend, uh, we can celebrate the great universal document of the Declaration of Independence, the moral pillar upon which the impeachment of Obama rests, that it's the right and it's the duty to abolish such forms of government that are injurious to the destiny of mankind. So I'm going to show some video, and then we can uh, we can actually maybe take part in reading this Declaration of Independence and get a sense of uh, some things here. What you have here is the uh, the violations that are enumerated in the. Uh, 
Declaration of Independence. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the rest of it up on the screen, and we can, um, as part of the celebration here, we can read this aloud and then take turns, uh, you know, one by one going through these objections that are, are, are listed. Is there enough light for people to read? do is just in a certain orderly fashion, starting here, uh, when we get to the point of the, of the violations, we should read through them, and, and people should imagine that they're in a town square, and are rather angry and impassioned. Yes, you'll probably get to say more than one. Declaration of the 13 States of the 13 United States of America. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among those powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. Uh, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to cause the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are <coughs> created equal, and that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the government, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for the light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are most disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object Envices, and uh, evices. Evi evices, a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let the facts be submitted to a candid world. I'm just talking about with the objections. I'm going to continue on, on this. Yeah, well, just read the first objection, then we're going to go through the whole oh, oh, read from this. <coughs> right. He has refused his assent to laws <clears throat> the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has no, forbidden. No, no, that's mine. We're going to go one through one, one by each one. Person gets one. What? Each one of us gets one. You just read one. Oh. Okay. <laughs> just imagine you're in a town square of really angry colonists. Right. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained 
which could take months on a ship, and when so suspended, he is utterly neglected to attend to them. Uh, he has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people. Unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing the man who front this as invasion on his invasion on the rights of people. He has refused for a long time after such dissolutions to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative powers incapable of annihilation have returned to the people at large for their exercise. The state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without and convulsions within. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states. For that purpose, obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of land. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judgment depend on his will along the tenor of, of their office and amount of payment of their salary. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people. And, uh, out their substance. Uh, he has kept among us in times of peace standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. Giselle, he has affected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to jurisdiction foreign to our constitution and acknowledged by our, by our laws, giving his assent to the acts of pretended legislation. Um, for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us. For protecting them by a mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states. We're cutting off our trade with all parts of the world. We're imposing taxes on us without our consent. We're depriving us in many cases of the benefit of trial by jury. Or transporting us beyond seas be tried for pretended offenses. For abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and a fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies. For taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our government. For suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has, he has rendered our seas, driving our hope, our hope, born our tongue, and destroyed the living of the lives of our people. He is a distant transporting a large army. Of foreign uh, mercenaries to complete the work of the resolution and tyranny already begun. The circumstances of cruelty and perfidy scarcely parallel in the most barbarous ages of totally 
We have to train our fellow citizens taking captive on high seas to bear arms against their country, to become the executives, to become the executions of their friends and brothers, or to fall or, or to bear themselves by their hands. To fall themselves by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an, an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. <clears throat> in every stage of these oppressions, we have petitions for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Is it two pages? Oh, that's, oh it's on the back, isn't it? No, no we weren't. No, we just threw it back. Really? <coughs> okay. Um, okay, yeah, right, that's it. Do you want to finish up what's on the screen here? You can reread what I just said. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for the redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. <coughs> a prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislator to extend an unwarranted jur jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our immigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, <coughs> magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, <coughs> which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They too have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguinity. We must therefore acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. We therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress, assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the, for the res rectitude. Rectis, uh? rectitude. rectitude of our intentions, do in name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states, that they are absolved from all the allegiance to the British crown, and that political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is, and ought to be, totally disavowed, and that, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge each, others, each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Okay. Is the idea of freedom Right, that most people would associate with the Declaration of Independence and our rights as citizens. But that tied up directly with the concept of freedom is not some arbitrary idea of like individual freedom. Like you do whatever you want to do. Right, that that's the, the, the Constitution is protecting your right to do whatever you want to do. But that it's there's a there's a a, harm, a a marriage of freedom and necessity, and you find this in the you find this in here that it's um, this part always struck out of me. Uh, whenever <clears throat> but when a long train of abuses and usurpations 
pursuing invariably the same object evinces a desire to reduce them under absolute despotism. It is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. So, that there's a standard of action, right? There's an obligation that we have as a people to prepare the way for a future. You see this, again, echoed in the preamble of the Constitution, right? For ourselves and our posterity. And this is what's being violated right now with, you know, with John Kerry and maybe the culture as a whole, um, although people are waking up out of it, is, um, you know, like what Sky gets at in his question on time, that there's a backdrop that the, the, the actions that we take as a people and as a government, as civilization, there's a backdrop of anti-entropy in the universe that we have to be in accord with. There's an obligation that we have to progress, right? And that you have the union here of science and morality. We have the obligation, the spiritual obligation, to progress in science. It's a spiritual endeavor. And that if we don't, we therefore have become morally unfit to survive. So I want to try to get at some of that, but um, on this idea of consent, right? When you think of this in, in a couple ways, Kerry's consent to Obama, is it the same as the consent that a free people gives to its, uh, its leadership, its governance, its government? Um, but this, this idea comes directly out of Cusa, Nicholas of Cusa who was dealing in the four, uh, 15th century with a separation of the two churches. And the East, the Eastern Orthodox, and then the church in the West, in Rome. Um, and the, the disagreement between the two was the question of this filioque. Right, which really gets at what the nature of man is. That you have the Nicene Creed, which has in it that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. But does it also proceed from the Son? Right, therefore, is God the Father and also the Son? Is the Holy Spirit in both? Therefore, who is Jesus? Was he simply the Son of God? Or did he participate fully in God? And his descending onto earth, what was he? Was he just a man? Well, he was full, you know, as the Catholic faith goes, he was fully man, but he was also fully God. And, you know, whatever religious persuasions people have, there's a, there's a really beautiful idea here in that, um, that in being both God and man, uh, that Jesus, he, he conquered death. And in so doing, he created the capability for human beings to do likewise, to, to conquer death. Um, and so it was this, you know, there's a, there a, an intellectual debate. Writings were referenced from the past. The Greeks were not originally in favor of um, agreeing to this idea of the filioque. But eventually, you know, going to the Council of Florence, um, Cusa organized this unification. And in so doing, created the possibility for the Renaissance and whatnot. Now, it didn't last long. It lasted maybe 20 years. Um, then Constantinople was, you know, sacked by the Ottoman Empire and whatnot. But, um, but you know, think about what Think about what LaRouche is doing today, and this, I'll, I'll touch on this again, with this conference that he's having in, um, in Germany, and who's attending, mm -hmm. right? This is a major political intervention. This is of the quality of what Cusa did with the Council of Florence, in terms of the implications of what's being discussed there for human civilization over the next hundreds and thousands of years, where if we shift today on this question of Glass-Steagall, we shift on the question of abandoning monetarist systems, you can really set into motion a whole 
you know, not, not a totally new civilization because it's, it's based on these principles of the past, but one that could be, for the first time, totally free of empire. So um, let me show this uh, clip from a, a video that was produced a couple years ago. So is there doubt? We see that. Right. Go ahead. Is there doubt that we can't handle when we get to that plateau, when we get to that 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 uh, uh, point in history where there's no more monetary system and there's doubt that we don't know what we're doing or where we're going if that happens? No, I think I think we do. I think it's the question of. I mean, obviously the monetary system is going away. It's collapsing right now. Yeah. But it's the question of organizing into being the idea which will take over. You, you think people can handle it? I hope. They have to. We have to. <laughs> yeah. We, 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 have, we have to. I mean, because it, it seems like there's, oh, there's a little doubt there that it, after it goes away, now we're into this new era. Can we handle it? Are we ready for it? I mean, uh, we're ready for it, obviously, but uh, can you handle it? This new okay, sure. world order, uh, if you will, not to use the. Yeah, sure. I think I think we can. Oh, I think it definitely blow people away. Yeah. I, 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 they, I need, they need it. They need it. Right. They need it. We need yeah. it. That's yeah. the weight of the ideas that you know we were just talking about. Like, I'm I'm definitely no expert in Kuza, um, because there's a lot that he wrote and. Um, you know, kind of new, newly coming to him. But his ideas for the time that he was living were, were very revolutionary, right? Like this idea of, um, like Aristotle was the reigning uh, mind of the time. Everybody referenced Aristotle. And you see this in like Kepler. Kepler references Aristotle because it's just part of the culture. If you're gonna communicate something, everybody, every, all, all the learned people, read Aristotle and knew Aristotle. But Aristotle said that everything exists in um, opposition to one another. That logic, logically, you have A and you have B, and A is not B. They can't be the same. But what Kuza gets at is that there's a, a coincidence of opposites. That actually things that seem in opposition and totally different, there's a there's actually a harmony there, right? So it's a totally new idea. You can think about it today in terms of, um, you know, I was going to get at this later in the, in the discussion, but of fascism, right? And what people were brainwashed with after World War II that fascism came to Germany because you know, the culture of the Germans with Beethoven was just too strict, right? You think of fascism, you think of like a police state and laws that you have to follow. Beethoven was the cause of fascism because his music was too strict. Or the fact that Germans potty trained their children at too early of an age <laughs> meant that the German people were susceptible to too much order. <laughs> and so, it's, it was this idea of, um, <laughs> it was this idea of, uh, of, of a, the, you know, the authoritarian personality that, you know, and people have come across this in our eyes before, the Congress for Cultural Freedom um, said that, you know, this was the problem in Germany. It was, it, was the, it was the imposition of one's ideas upon another. That was the police state. So therefore, if you try to assert a principle of truth, you're on, a, you're on a slippery slope because you're acting like Hitler, you're acting like a Nazi. You're trying to impose yourself upon someone else. So therefore, there is no truth. You have to respect other people's opinions. But of course, you know, so you get all this nice liberalism today. We all live, you know, tolerance. You know, what came out of you know, tolerate? You have to tolerate other people. But the Nazis didn't operate off of a principle of truth. They didn't believe in it. They, they believed in raw power. They believed in Nietzsche. 
and the ability to impose yourself upon other people. So it wasn't the truth that they were asserting. Right? It was the. That's like I'm going to today. Yeah. <laughs> right. And even the cause is like our situation today. The real cause of Nazism was fear and hunger. People so, were so losing their whole society, and they had people had to take a weak liver, literally take a wheelbarrow full of money to a great bakery yeah. to buy bread, and they were terrible. Well, it's a, it is. And when some person stood up there and shouted with a firm hand, I'm going to lead you back to where you were before the last war. They came up behind them. And I had, that's happening. Let me say this, this because the people. The, with a slightly different twist. Right, because it, it wasn't simply just that they went through this, that Hitler, like the idea of a fascist coup, was not simply that Hitler just like came in and said, I'm dictator. Mm -hmm. Right, it was, a, it was a moral, it was, it was consent in the wrong sense of the term, right? Like, carries consent today to Obama, right? So actually, it is this idea, going back to, just when we finish the point on Kuza and the coincidence of opposites, you'd be struck at this idea that, you know, as Lynn says, the 68 movement, the movement generation was a fascist movement, but how could that be? They're, they're talking about flowers. They're talking about <laughs> love and toleration. How could this? How could this be fascism? Mm -hmm. Because it's the denial of truth. Right? That actually freedom for humans is bound up with the idea of, of truth, necessity, and obligation, a standard that you operate by. So I'm going to just um, getting into, this is just be a little bit on Kuza. We see that by the gift of God there is present in all things a natural desire to exist in the best manner in which the condition of each thing's nature permits this. And we see that all things act toward this end and have instruments adopted thereto. They have an innate sense of judgment which serves the purpose of knowing. They have this in order that their desire not be in vain but be able to attain the rest in that respective object which is desired by the propensity of each thing's own nature, since all things exist in the best way they are able to exist. With his developing intellectual might, Kuza, as a priest and then as a cardinal, devoted his life to ensure that the narrow pathway that leads to truth could be found by many. He extended his anti-Aristotelian scientific understandings to the relationship among God, man, and the universe, to the problem of unifying the Eastern Orthodox and Western Roman churches. In this endeavor, he persistently insisted that the unification occur through the acceptance of the concept of the filioque, that creativity emanates from both God the Father and God the Son to mankind, which was the biggest source of controversy between the two. Two decades before getting involved in organizing for the Council of Florence, Cusa participated at the Council of Constance, the conference that ended the strife caused by three popes who all claimed to be the legitimate head of the Catholic Church. During the session there, Nicholas befriended the rising Platonist Cosimo de Medici. After the Council of Constance, Cusa carried on his studies at the University of Padua, surrounding himself with the city's top intellectuals, such as Giuliano Cesarini and Imbroglio Traveseri, who translated the works of Plato and Aristotle, provoking profound debates about the good, the value of poetry, and the nature of the community. Coincidentally, in Padua, he met and began a lifelong friendship with Paolo dal Pozzo Toscanelli, with whom in later years he would engage in deep dialogue about mapping and geography. Through this friendship, Cusa also became acquainted with the great artist Leone Battista Alberti and Filippo Brunelleschi. Such was the environment of his thinking. His first application of his intellectual understanding to a significant political problem occurred at the Council of Basel, the first council set up to address unification with the Eastern Greek churches. Though at Basel, one could only find deep corruption and haughtiness. This situation forced Pope Eugene IV, a friend of Cusa, to move the discussion to Ferrara, a location that enabled the Pope to participate directly in dialogue with the Greeks. 
Kuza, as part of minority delegation, left Basel and traveled directly to Constantinople in order to recruit a Greek contingency that would participate. During his stay, he successfully located crucial documents proving that the formulation of the Filioque had been part of the creed in the early councils, when the two churches were one. With those documents and his ingenuity, Kuz and his comrades sailed to Ferrara with 700 representatives of the church and scholars, including the patriarch and the Byzantine emperor. Soon, the council in Ferrara would shift its location to Florence. Though the Council of Basel was a farce, Cusa had constructed an idea of the principle that would underlie the formation of the modern nation-state while there. His political thinking was not limited to questions about the church. The church was merely that upon which he could immediately act. In the process of convincing the unification of the two churches, he developed a clear idea of the political formation of the nation, which had not existed since Dante Alighieri. At Basel, Nicholas devoted the working of his mind to the principles of natural law by which a state must be governed. All legitimate power arises from elective concordance and free submission. There is in the people a divine seed by virtue of their common equal birth and the equal natural rights of all men, so that the authority, which comes from God as does man himself, is recognized as divine when it arises from the common consent of the subjects. One who is established in authority as representative of the will of all may be called a public or a common person, the father of all, ruling without haughtiness or pride in a lawful and legitimately established government. While recognizing himself as a creature, as it were, of all his subjects as a collectivity, let him act as their father as individuals. That is the divinely ordained marital state of spiritual union based on a lasting harmony by which a commonwealth is best guided in the fullness of peace toward the good of eternal bliss. If you're going to uh, accomplish anything good, you have, to, you have to destroy evil. And you had this, this evil system which had dominated civilization despite the fact that people were fighting against it in rear guard actions. And you had some, some breakthroughs. I mentioned earlier that Kuza was building on the, on the uh, foundation that was laid by Dante earlier, who, who made a tremendous advance for mankind in fighting for this idea. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem was is that the uh, power, the political power of the empire oligarchy, whether it was the landed aristocracy or whether it was this new, newer financial aristocracy represented by the Venetian Empire, which used not land, but control of the seas, control of trade, control of finance, control of insurance, intelligence, this kind of thing, um, to control, to, to maintain this fixed order in society. Finally, the idea of a representative system, as conceived by Dante earlier, in defiance of oligarchy, was definitively stated, in which elected representatives enter a reciprocal legal relationship with both the government and the governed. This would be the institutional function of a sovereign nation-state republic. Human beings have built cities and adopted laws to preserve unity and harmony, and they established guardians of all of these laws, with the power necessary to provide for the general welfare. For this purpose, the ruler should have the best qualified of his subjects chosen from all parts of his realm to participate in a daily council with him. These counselors ought to represent all the inhabitants of the realm. These counselors ought constantly to defend the good of the public which they represent, giving advice and serving as the appropriate means through which the king can govern and influence his subjects, and the subjects on proper occasion can influence him in return. The great strength of the kingdom comes from this daily council. The councillors should be appointed to this task by agreement in a general meeting of the kingdom, and they should be publicly bound legally by oath to speak out openly for the public good. No! 
Although not adopted in full by the councils, the concept of a modern nation state had now been born, a light for all souls who had walked and would yet walk the earth. In Florence, the council proclaimed, let the heavens rejoice in Brunelleschi's dome, as the churches of East and West finally unified under the filioque, thanks to the documents acquired by Cusa. The Greeks that Nicholas had organized brought to Florence the complete dialogues of Plato, marking the day when Europe had finally revived the great thoughts that represented the highest intellectual achievements of Athens. The works of Plato predominated all discussions in Florence, inspiring Cosmo de' Medici to found the first Platonic Academy in modern Europe. With an atmosphere susceptible to cognitive thinking, these great works spread like wildfire amongst the commons, paving the way for the emergence of the Italian Golden Renaissance of the 15th century. Such an environment brought forth a higher density of creative thinking, expressed through further investigations of physical science, the promotion of bel canto singing, and all other arts. Pacioli and Leonardo da Vinci would rise as the leading promoters of that society, contributing further to the developments of mankind with paintings that reflected the aesthetical nature of man and his inventions. With the affirmation by Cardinal Nicholas of Cusa of this new form of government, the first modern sovereign nation-state rose under Louis XI of France, who in turn was also under the influence of the Brothers of the Common Life. Henry VII soon followed his suit, establishing his own sovereign government in England with the overthrow of that tyrannical Richard III. Louis XI asserted a system above the system of empire, implementing taxes in the form of tariffs that increased overall production, protecting and encouraging the harvest of wheat and other agriculture while increasing the mining of resources. He broke the power of the feudal lords over the people by abolishing private warfare. Before his death, Louis XI would write the rose bush of the war for his son to ensure that the common good of the people and nation were upheld as of the most important function of a ruler. There he summarized the responsibilities of a ruler as he wrote, Each should seek to have a good soul, and not put his heart too much in the world or its goods which he must leave finally behind. This passage will pass all valiant warriors, all wise men, all saints, and those who from Adam and Eve descended and will descend, none remaining, but only the renown of their acts will remain. Thus the prince must provide for maintenance of public works and edifices, to improve and repair roads, bridges, the ports, the walls, the moats, and the other things in his towns and castles, which are necessary for the care of his people. But these achievements could only go so far. In the latter part of his years, it became evident to Cusa that the culture of Europe was heavily corrupted by oligarchism. He understood that the degeneracy of the population was so deep that any form of human progress that took place on the continent would have its limit. He forecast rightfully, for the events of the coming years, long after the Council of Florence, proved that Europe was too weak to preserve the best of its own culture. Foreseeing that Europeans would succumb to this cultural manipulation of the oligarchy, Nicholas conspired with his lifelong friends Paolo Toscanelli and for now Martins to flank this predictable self-destruction by traveling west off the coasts of the European continent in search of lands in which civilization could settle and develop freely away from the corruption of Europe. Before they could find a way to accomplish this, Cusa died. His two most intimate friends were with him, signing his last testament on August 6, 1464, standing by his bedside and comforting their dying friend until he finally departed five days later. Toscanelli and Martins ensured that Nicholas of Cusa had not lived in vain by working to make his dream a reality. Finally, after rigorous searching, Martins became acquainted with the young future admiral Christopher Columbus and befriended him in the 1470s. The two spoke much to each other, and during the course of dialogue, Martins introduced the admiral to the plot that he, Toscanelli, and Cusa had previously discussed. Thereafter, he brought Columbus into direct correspondence with Toscanelli in which the Admiral was given access to all of Toscanelli's works, 
including a map that would guide him safely to achieve Cusa's mission. A master, Paolo Toscanelli, a Florentine contemporary to the same admiral, was the cause in great measure of his undertaking this voyage with greater spirit. The fact that the sighted Paolo was a friend of Fernão Martins, and that the two were writing letters to each other about the sea voyages made to the country of Guinea during the time of King Alfonso of Portugal, and about what could be done in the westward direction, came to the ears of the admiral who was most curious about these things. And he hastened to write to the said Master Paolo about this, and sent to him an armillary sphere, revealing to him his intent. And Nicholas of Cusa had specified crossing the oceans to save European civilization by taking it, the best part of it, across the oceans, away from Europe, then build it up and bring it back into Europe. That was his policy. So, and Christopher Columbus made his voyage across the Atlantic on the basis of the writings of Nicholas of Cusa and the files. And the, the, that was, this occurred about 1480, 1492, of course, he crossed the ocean. But Columbus's first voyage, the purpose behind it, the drive, was the colonization of North America in particular, but also the Americas more generally, but North America in particular, as a place to take European civilization, get the hell away from Europe and the corruption of the oligarchical traditions of Europe, the reactionary traditions, and take the best of European civilization, transplant it into the Americas, and then build up the culture, and then return to Europe and try to bring Europe back into some sensible operation. So that's the general span of the story. Did gold, uh, wealth and gold get in the way of the plan, of the high-minded plan of the Columbus? The Habsburg Empire got in the way of the high-minded plan. And this is, a, this is an interesting investigation um, <coughs> of Columbus because, you know, he's often maligned today. Um, in fact, I think there's a concurrent celebration on Columbus Day called Indigenous Peoples Day <laughs> to sort of steal the, uh, the fire away from, uh, from Columbus and what he did. But it's really interesting because, uh, you know, I, I, I think the gov I'm not so sure on the details on this, but I think the government in Spain, uh, under his initial voyage, was different than in later years. That you had increasingly the Habsburg uh, imperial interests that came in to take over, obviously with the intention of crushing any kind of like scientific expansion. That's the one that said the world was flat. Yeah, no, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure how much the world is flat thing actually came up in the. Yeah, all right, okay, all right. I don't know that's okay. where it came from, because uh, obviously with the Greeks before, you know, you had Eratosthenes who understood that the world was was round. Mm -hmm. Uh, spherical, but um, was Brazil I mean, expulsion of Jews and just religious war was launched to crush what things they done in the Renaissance? Yeah, which was in retaliation for the Renaissance. I mean, as 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 was discussed in the video, you had this. I mean, even though Cusa knew that the the ideas of the Council of Florence of a new government, of a nation state based on principle, you know, consent of the governed, and the, uh, the idea of the common good, would, at a certain point, he realized that, that was incapable of being achieved in Europe because of the corruption of the, you know, the oligarchy and the culture there. But yet, it made its way <coughs> a certain degree in Europe, you know, with Henry VII and Louis XI. Um, so it was just a backlash like you're seeing today, where you know the United States is being pitted in wars to destroy us, to destroy our culture, where ironically enough, you know, where Kerry came out of the Vietnam War, right, intentionally imposed upon the United States to destroy the culture from within, and get a get an insane reaction from uh, you know from the baby boomer class who didn't want to get drafted and chose escape from reality, drugs and whatnot instead. <clears throat> so, um, 
But yeah, so then you had the Habsburgs take over and really crush this. But like I was saying, the investigation on Columbus is really interesting because obviously there's these connections to the Renaissance. And it's not, it's nothing, I mean, there's, there's, there is some pretty direct stuff, but if you read the original sources, like Columbus's accounts of the voyage, he, <coughs> keeps, two, he keeps two logs of the voyage, right? There's an official log uh, and an official idea of how far they've traveled that he's communicating to his sailors so that they're not freaked out. And there's an official correspondence that he's communicating back to Spain and like, or you know, an account. But then there's his own private law. And so, you know, in the context of that time, you know, whatever, whatever we can ultimately pin down as Columbus's intention, hopefully it's the high-minded idea, right? You know that there's not going to, the only way to actually fund or, uh, you know, engage in an expedition like the one he's taking is to organize governments that may or may not be the most high-minded. You know, they may want the gl greater glory of Spain and gold and things like that. So, but, <laughs> so obviously that fails, uh, at least under the Spanish control, but then eventually succeeds with the Massachusetts Bay Colony and the fight, you know, in the North, you know, in North America, and then ultimately Declaration and Constitution. If Obama gets more powers, like to bomb Libya or other places without going to the Congress for approval, is there really danger that that he could become the kind of dictator like Hitler did? I I don't think it would turn out exactly like that. The the military would have to take over and be with him and say you're arresting the Congress and so on, you know, and, and the people would never stand for that. They would be riots. Yeah, just, I mean, I it, it wouldn't exactly turn out. I you know, think people said the same thing in Germany before he let me Yeah, but it was a different situation. Germany, but people well, that's like any other country in Europe, was always on the king and his queen and state. They never had a real democracy like the U.S. where we were founded. Yeah, I think the thing, I think the key thing Lynn's getting at is is liberalism. Now I agree that in the United States you have a different culture. Yeah. There's 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 more of a. Uh, well, it's still it's still in the bones, but you have a, a reservoir of uh, an objection to this type of stuff. So obviously it's not the same exact situation. But but if but you know who cares if it's directly like Hitler or not, obviously it's an injustice. Obviously it's going to be a disaster. And you could have the same number of deaths. More. No, more. Exactly, more. I mean, you think about it like... It the, with, much, what Obama will do will be much worse. I mean, think, think about what's, uh, just like on the environmentalism question, mm -hmm. you're talking about billions of people being wiped out, right? It's, that's a stated explicit policy by the British, by this guy Schellenhuber in Germany. Right, the program that they're adopting there. Uh, obviously, that's way beyond the levels that Hitler ever achieved. But let me get back here. We can, because uh, just the one thing I want to like get at with the, the the idea of freedom, the freedom that we have in, in the United States, it comes out of necessity, and you know, it's not. So you, so you have Cusa that realizes that you have to get out of Europe, right? That you can't achieve the, the plan there. And it's, you know, so if you look at Columbus, the thing I really like about this idea is that, you know, we, we gotta get, we have to have a, a mission orientation for our culture right now. Space exploration, you know, combined with what we wanna do on the WAPA and the like is that. But if you think about what Columbus was doing at the time, and it's totally synonymous with you know, space exploration today. They were going out into the total unknown, you know, maybe with an inkling that there was lands on the other side of the Earth. And that's another interesting story, too, in, in terms of what was actually known about what was there. But um, it's totally synonymous with today. And you see that it was, 
it, it was that idea, Columbus's voyage, as a as a an advance in navigation, as an advance in our knowledge of the earth, that that was what gave us the possibility of having the United States, right? And so, so today it's that same necessity to advance culturally, scientifically, which is going to be our capability of, of saving this country, saving the United States, and um, you know, saving civilization. Um, so maybe I could have got at that a little clearer, but I'm just going to, just to spark people's optimism. Our good commander, Frank Warren, had a little problem. I got nauseous on the way to the moon. I won't go into biological details, but uh, basically it was a mess in the spacecraft. But of course, we didn't want to abort this mission. That was the one thing we didn't want to do. That created an enormous controversy back on the Earth. You know, the doctors had an opportunity to say, maybe we need to recall a mission and all that baloney. There wasn't anything we could do about it anyway. We were going to go to the moon whether he was sick or not. <laughs> Pretty soon, you know, we just, well, well what's for dinner? <laughs> you know. Apollo 8 hurdles through space faster than any humans have ever traveled. On a non-stop flight to the moon, a quarter million miles away. Each flight was like a big open house, and all the wives and all the husbands and what have you. Chris Kraft came over, and I asked him, I said, you know, are you co as confident as Frank is about getting back? It was a risk. I mean, no, nothing is certain, particularly in space flight, is anything certain. He thought for a minute, and he said, you know, Susan, I think we've got a good 50-50 chance of getting them back. And I said, oh. Thank you, because that's a lot better than what I was thinking. Apollo 8 is shooting blindly for the moon. Computers calculate their trajectory. If the numbers are off by even a little, they'll either crash into the lunar surface or miss the moon completely and just keep going. Apollo 8, you've been on the LOS all the systems go. This was one of the more exciting parts of the flight because we knew that if we lost radio communication when we were masked by the moon, when we were supposed to on the flight plan, we were exactly on trajectory. We were upside down and backwards in complete darkness. The biggest thing in our minds were where we could hit the moon. And at the exact millisecond we were supposed to lose the radio, we lost it. You just have to think, going 240,000 miles and then aiming for a point 60 miles above the surface, but it, I think we came out within a mile and a half of where we were supposed to be. And I looked out and I could see there were stars everywhere except this big black hole. It was blacker than pitch, and that was the moon. I know the hair stands up on my neck. It looked like a mess. It had all kinds of meteor craters and volcanoes and looked very, very unfriendly. For the first time in human history, men look upon the far side of the moon with their own eyes. They're just 70 miles away. Well, it was, on, I don't know, sixth or seventh or eighth revolution we looked up. And that's when, when we came into sunlight, we were all totally amazed by the earth rise. A beautiful sight. There was a big scramble for cameras. Everybody started snapping away. Fortunately for me, I had a color film and a long lens. Every newspaper, every print magazine, anything has been on everything, and true. It is probably one of the greatest photographs of that century, seeing the Earth as it really is. It's tiny out there, it's inconsequential. It was ironic that we had uh, come to study the moon and was really discovering the Earth. Just prior 
to Christmas Eve, we read uh, from the first few verses of the book of Genesis. were so beautiful. Christmas, the moon, they were so far away. Overwhelming. Everybody cried. <laughs> going up in a space shuttle, you know, it's a big deal, but you're orbiting the Earth, you know, you're really kind of just, you're in a layer around the Earth in a certain sense. Going to the moon is totally different. You're disengaging from the gravity of the Earth, and you are engaging the gravity of, of the moon. So you're, you know, totally different. Like, that, that was the danger of these shots, right, is that you get something wrong, and you just, you're off in outer space or something. So, like, we're not... You know, not to undermine, obviously, the shuttle missions and whatnot, but these moon shots were uh, it's more difficult to qualitatively different. Yeah. And so much less was known about the moon back then. Yeah. It's hard to envision now how people were like, sitting on pins and needles mm -hmm. because supposedly the scientists knew what to expect, but the reality was that no one was certain what they were encountering. Well, now we got to get together and figure out what's going on with the weather and make sure we understand the earth <laughs> before we die. 